Uh, in your Bibles back in Matthew 28, what I'd like to do with you real quickly is, is kind of, uh, we're, we're at a halfway point. 13 weeks ago, I began, some of you remember, and I said, I want you to imagine that we're sitting at, at you know, Water Street, Big B's, or Starbucks, or somewhere, across the table, Bible, talking face to face. How many of you remember I said that? Come on. Okay, most of you were, oh, yeah, I said it right at the beginning of the series and repeated a few times. That's this concept of face-to-face -face discipleship. And what I mean by that is something that can't fully be done electronically, something that can't be done just by reading a static, you know, paper or electronic page. There's a dynamic of reasoning through these truths in a personal way. That's the face-to-face. -face. And that actually is the heart of what biblical discipleship is all about. And so what, what I'm going to do with you right now is I'm going to take you through the Gospels and some of the epistles and show you if, if you took everything, in fact, I have a lot of it, uh, about 80 different discipleship manuals. I collect them in my library of all the different ways from the spiritual disciplines and from the, you know, the, the, Two seven this and the the uh, you know Rick Warren's that you know all of these different discipleship programs I collect a copy of each one of them, and from time to time I take them and spread them out on a big eight foot table and open all of them to their their table of contents and I look at all of the disciplines or the discipleship lessons or the whatever they call them the elements, and I just check if anybody has found any new ones, because they haven't. Because all of them radiate back to the scriptures, or they should. Uh, and, and basically, what we're going to see in Matthew, if you look, especially verse 20, look at the first part of verse 20. It says, teaching them to observe all the things I taught you. Well, if you take all of the volume of literature written on discipleship and cross-check it with your Bible, you'll find that there are seven broad areas every discipleship program covers. Now, they call them something different. That's what I, I'm intrigued by it. Everyone has a different vocabulary. Everyone has a different nomenclature and, and, and the elements that, in the order they list them in. But what I'd like to show you is they all go back to the scriptures. And basically, what we find is there are seven areas that need to be trained as a part of our routine of life, something that's in our operating system, something that, uh, just like when you turn your computer on, it chugs along and, and it goes through all of its opening sequence, we are supposed to chug through life with this sequence, now look at this, to be useful to God. Now I want you to think about something. In fact, I have an illustration right here. I carry a pen because I write all the time. This is a pen. You can't see it from where you're sitting, but trust me, it is. Do you know this pen was designed in Japan? Uh, and, and it was designed to hold ink and not have it come out in my pocket. It was designed when I push the top that the part that right comes out, and I push it again, it goes away. I can see how much ink I have. I know what color it is, the color of the barrel. And when I go like this, it works. Now, this thing, I could do a lot of other things. I think I could probably stir things with it. It could be, a, you know, like a paperweight. It could be a tie clip, I guess, you know. But what was it designed to be? It was designed to work when I click it and to have green ink and to write. That's what makes it useful. I, in fact, my daughters just said, Dad, what can we get you for... Christmas, I said, well, you know what? I use constant pens, and I love all different colors. And you know, you know why I never have too many pens? Because as soon as they don't work, what do you do? Throw them away, unless they're expensive, you know, and you can get a refill for them. Did you know in life, we don't even think about that? I mean, when you look at this, you know what it's for. It's, it's a pen, and it's not for, it's not to, if you see someone stirring your dinner with it, you say, whoa, whoa, whoa you shouldn't do that. It wasn't made for that. Did you know that God, in his word, tells us, as a believer, to be highly useful to him, there are some things he wants in our lives. And it's just like anything else in life. If it was designed for a purpose, 
and you buy it or, or, or it's given to you and it doesn't do what it was designed to do, you're disappointed. And you say, whoa, you know, that's, that's not what I, what I wanted it to do. Did you know, for us, God in his word called and designed us to have someone personally, face-to-face, meet and teach us the habits, the way of life of being highly useful to God. And, and it's right in the scriptures. Look, look in your Bibles. It says in, in verse 19, go therefore and make disciples. That's leading them to Christ. And, and a person who is led to Christ is a learner of Christ, a disciple. And then baptize them in the name. Have them profess in verse 19 that they believe in the name, the, the triune God, singular name, but he is a father, a son, and a Holy Spirit. And after they're really genuinely born again, verse 20, teach them. So discipleship, we could say, is biblical. And today, as we look at our Great Commission call to go and make disciples, we're using the very same textbook. Where did we find this Great Commission call? It's the very same textbook the church has always used, the Bible. Now, I want you to think about that with me for a minute, because we're using the actual original syllabus God gave. It's the very same materials Christ church has always had and always used. From the beginning, the church overspread the world using this very same tool you and I are holding, the Bible, God's Word. And I want you to think about what we have in the Bible. The Bible is amazingly clear. It's the plan God left. It's not like we have to go have a retreat somewhere and figure out a new version of what we're going to do this year. God left an amazingly clear plan that we all have the very same one in his word. And it's the only guidebook that's packed with divine power. You know, I got a little uh, thing, you know, you can write on the glass top of your electronic device with another device, and it's trying to mimic a pen. You know, it's a stylus deal. And, and I got it, and I thought, oh, man, this thing's so small. How will I ever find a battery that size? And as I finished opening the package, little mini, mini, winny battery that went right in that thing. It was just right. And in the package was the power source. In the package, the power, God says, if you use my word, it comes packed with the power to make it work. You don't have to make it work. See, I don't have to drum up the power to see people's lives change. And I don't have to exhaust myself trying to change people. God says, the guidebook, his word, the Bible, comes packed with the power source that does it. By the way, no other book in my library other than the Bible has the power source inside the actual words of the book. That's why the Bible is not like anything else that you and I touch. This is the very power of God unto salvation to all who believe. It's also a perfect resource. It's been tested throughout the world. You know, you you can travel somewhere, and our phones, if they're not GSM, don't work you know, in the GSM zones because we're whatever we are over here. And, and, and you can have your little cord to plug in the wall, but you look, and if you're in Great Britain, you know, it has a configuration. If you're on the continent, it has a different one. If you're in the, the Orient, it's different. It looks like the continent of Europe, but they've changed the, the way their prongs go in. And everything is different, and it doesn't, it's 220, and, and, and we have 110, and it just doesn't work. Did you know that the Bible is a perfect resource? It's been tested throughout the world. It works in every generation, every geographic setting. It's always worked perfectly. Now, think about the power of God to do something that, notice back to verse 19. As soon as they get saved, verse 20, they're supposed to be taught. Discipleship is basic. It's just, it's supposed to be saved, baptized, taught. And That's just a simple plan. But think about that, because with the discipleship plan written out and ready to go, right in the Word of God, it seems that many are not focusing on using it. In fact, to some, their life as a believer becomes a bewildering and confusing search for something else. 
They're just looking for the newest or the latest or the most popular spiritual idea or whatever is just trending right now or book or program. And it often seems like everybody is chasing after a different plan or a newer program. And that's kind of where the church is in the 21st century. In fact, some Christians are actually exhausted. They're just trying to keep up with each new emphasis. And, and you know, they've started all of them, and they're just trying to keep them all going. It's like plates on, on poles that they have to run around. And their Christian life is, at this seminar, they heard that, and they're just twisting the poles to keep the plates all spinning. And they're bewildered that there's so many different poles and plates and things to do. And that's not what Jesus left us to do. We're not left to chase the newest Christian idea trending through Twitter, posted online, and shared on Facebook. Instead, every new generation is called to go back to the Scripture. Called to go back and see what verse 20 says. Teaching them to observe what? All things I commanded you. It, it has to be what Jesus said is to be taught. So this morning, what I thought... I would do is just take you on a little journey. In fact, I'll take you, turn back to Matthew 1, and I'm going to show you something. If you took the Gospel of Matthew and actually a little bit in the Gospel of John, and we'll just jump into one of the epistles, but in Matthew, Matthew records Jesus' teaching almost all seven of what we find in every discipleship program. And what's so interesting is all they're doing is renaming, repackaging, re-spinning old truth. And what we have to do is realize what the old truth is. So in Matthew 1, look at verse 21 of Matthew 1. This is the commission from the angel to Joseph for the circumcision of Christ because the father, and Joseph was standing in as the father uh, with Mary for Jesus, on the day, the eighth day, the circumcision day, they're the ones that announced to the public, the friends and family gathered at the synagogue, the name of the child. We already saw that with Zacharias. Remember, he was unable to speak. And finally, when they give him the chalkboard to ask what the name of this baby born to him and to Elizabeth was to be called, he spoke and said his name is John. That's the first time anybody knew John the Baptist's name because the dad shares it. Do you know who the first one to share the name of Jesus was? Joseph. And, and he said, the angel told me to call his name Jesus. But look at what verse 21 says. He is the one that will save his people. The first element, the first habit of highly useful believers is they have to be taught the gospel. They have to be taught the, what the gospel means. Do you know what the gospel means? Once we're saved, we're saved from our sins. And look down at verse 23, what it says. And he shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. What does salvation do? Salvation forgives us of our sins and gives us a lifelong presence of God with us. So we are forgiven of all of our sins because how many times did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, remember we're at the coffee shop. How many times did Jesus die on the cross? Yeah. That, you just hit on one of the major doctrines of the Bible. If Jesus died once, then he paid the price, as it says in John 1, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If Jesus didn't die for all of your sins, then he didn't die for any of them because he only died once. And if that sacrifice didn't cover my past, present, and future sins, then none of them are forgiven. You understand that? Salvation is a very, very important truth to understand. Remember two weeks ago we were talking about justified and reconciled and adopted and sanctified and redeemed? Remember all those elements? That's what is packaged in salvation. And Jesus in chapter 1 of Matthew talks about that. Now turn over to chapter 4 and look at verse 4. Remember Jesus is discoursing with his highest created being, the devil, who was formerly Lucifer, the anointed cherub in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. 
And he is coming as the God of this world, Paul calls him in Ephesians 2, to challenge Jesus Christ to keep him from the cross, to make him disobey God and not be the perfect sacrifice and live the perfect life. If he could have just nudged Jesus to do anything on his own apart from the will of God, he wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice. So what does Jesus say? He said, mm, man shall not live. And this man does not, he's talking about himself and all of us, by bread alone. He said, I'm human, but I don't just exist humanly, but by every word of God. And do you know how we know he was telling the truth? He quotes three times from the book of Deuteronomy in that temptation you're looking at right there in chapter 4. Jesus, as a human, Luke 2 says, grew in wisdom and stature and knowledge with God and man. Jesus learned memorized, studied, and digested the scripture as a human. You know, he didn't need to. He was God. Everything he said was scripture. But he came to fulfill the truth. And so the lesson is, Jesus says, we need to have a habit of also being fed on the word. If you want to be highly useful to God, feed your soul, your, the core of your being, your mind, on the Word of God. Now, you know, our minds are voracious. You know what that means? They're, they're hungry all the time. And Jesus said, your mind needs to be fed the Word of God. And if you're not feeding your mind the Word of God, what are you feeding? It? You know, we all feed our minds something. You, did you notice when you have free time, you, you want to do something, you want to listen to something or play something or watch something or do, your mind is voracious. It, it wants stimulation and activity. And Jesus said, don't just give it the physical stuff, but give it every word of God. So he's saying we should be word-fed. Now look what happens in chapter 316 is Christ's baptism of Matthew. Now what does chapter 4, verse 1 say? That he was led into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. Now here's something. I want you to think about this. Jesus went straight from his baptism into the wilderness of temptation. Guess what? In Matthew 28, it said, as soon as someone gets saved, they're supposed to be baptized. Jesus went right from his baptism into the wilderness of temptation, and so do most believers. They just don't know it. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew he was going to face the devil, and he was prepared with the word of God. And that's this next element. Jesus was watchful. He was ready. And where I get that from is in Matthew 26, and we could get there later. He says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Uh, the spirit is, is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what he said is, anybody that's saved and feeding on the word of God realizes that Satan has one goal. He wants to nudge us. Just He doesn't have to make all of us burst into a newspaper office and shoot and mow down 12 people like those brothers did in Paris that's been on the news all week. He doesn't need us to, to shoot up a supermarket like the other one did. All he has to do is just nudge us away from obeying the Lord. And then we're kind of like my pen. When my pen does not do what it was designed to do, it's not useful. If Satan can get us just off from what God designed and called us to do, we're not useful. And that's all he wants to do. He doesn't want to make everybody into a serial rapist or a, a mainline heroin user, you know, sticking the needle in your veins. He doesn't want everybody doing horrible stuff. He just wants us to not be useful to God. Does it matter how unuseful we are if we're not useful? Any uselessness counts. And so Jesus said, be watchful and watch out. And by the way, um, when we get to that, and we haven't covered that yet, by the way, all seven, can you tell? We've already done this one, we've already done this one, uh, we've already done this one, and we've already done this one. So for those of you to know, we've actually finished four. Uh, but the next one is, go to chapter six, and look at verse 9 of Matthew. Jesus wants us also to know that we can't live without connection to him. Uh, in fact, prayer is a connection to God. Prayer is all about a cord that, that causes us to have a, 
a conduit of communication and power between us and the infinite God of the universe. Prayer is our attachment. Do you ever watch the, the movies about spacewalks or when they're, they're doing the Skylab? You know how those, those astronauts, uh, they have to have that pack with them and they have to have some connection because they'll float away. Our connection so we don't float away from God is prayer. And you know, that cord, that cord of prayer, needing to pray and be connected to God all the time, sometimes it's challenging. I mean, I, I told the first service that in the 80s when I was pastoring in New England, we lived in a 160-plus-year-old mansion that all the pastors had lived in for generations that was bought by the DuPont family and the pastor had to live in it. And it had all these gardens and hedges and I was supposed to trim all those things. So you know me, I was studying all the time and, and it was time to trim the hedges and I'd try and do them all fast, you know? And I would get my cord out and I'd have it over and it'd be like this and all of a sudden I'd go, Whoop. I'd cut my own cord. I did that, so, my, my hedge trimmer had so many wrappings of, you know, being repaired and everything. But did you know, as soon as the cord was cut, the trimmer stopped. Did you know a lot of believers are not running on power to God? Their cord is cut. They are not connected to God. Prayer does not characterize their life. They don't pray without ceasing, and their trimmer isn't working. <laughs> and they can't figure out the connection. And God says, teach them after this manner to pray. And by the way, the Lord's Prayer, when we get to it, we haven't done that one yet either. Uh, we're going to do that one um, actually starting next week. The Lord's Prayer is almost a microcosm. There are seven elements in the Lord's Prayer that reflect all the elements. And then the spirit filled we covered that apart from the spirit we can do nothing, and that's in John chapter 7. This invested is back in Matthew 25, verses 21 and 23. Remember the words, well done, good and faithful what? Servant. He says, you... Twice he says it in verse 21 and verse 23. He says, you have been a good and faithful servant because I have made you and trust you with a little and you've been faithful in that. You have invested your life well. Did you know we all get a little meter of 60 minutes an hour are flowing through our little meter of time. It's a river. Time is like electricity or water. It's just flowing through the pipes. And what, it, what we're supposed to do is, as that river of time flows by us, we're supposed to be redeeming time, investing, pulling time out of the river flowing by of our lives and investing it as God's servant. And how do we do that? Well, this connection thing tells us in the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I want to do your will on earth. I want, I want, to, do what, I want to do what you designed me to do. I want to, be, I want to be the pen you designed me to be. I want to, to do what you designed me to do for your glory. I only can do that connected. I can only do it in the power of his spirit. I can only do it if I want to invest my life. And this one we covered last week, by the way, that's the Romans 12, consecrated. This is all about me every day renewing my mind to say, hey, you've got two choices. There's only two choices uh, that, that lay before me, pleasing God or pleasing myself. Which is going to be my choice today? I have to have my mind transformed every day to say, I should live for the God that I can't see I should live for the place that I'm not at. I'm supposed to live for the heavenly city. I'm a citizen up there, and I need my mind transformed because everything on earth is so glitteringly real to me, it's easier to live my life here. Do you know, an unconsecrated life, a life that's not presented back to God, is a kind of a fun life. Did you know if you're saved, you'll go to heaven? But... If you're not consecrated, if you don't present your life back to God, as Paul said, he pleaded with us to do, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do you know what happens? In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, we're all going to stand, all saved people, are going to stand one by one in front of Jesus Christ and look up at him. It says he's going to be on a raised bema. And we're going to look up at him, and it's going to be one of these this was your life moments. And he is going to take our whole life 
and he's going to dump our life in front of his throne in a consuming fire. And our life is going to pass through the fire, and whatever makes it through was either gold or silver or precious stones. It was life that was lived for his glory, that was invested as his servant, that was lived in the power of the Spirit, that was lived connected to God. The cord was there, and we were saying, not my will, your will be done today. Watching out from not getting nudged out of usefulness, understanding what he wants us to do is we're fed on the word because we were bought at a price. And whatever survives that fire is going to be our eternal reward. Do you know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3? It says there are actually going to be people in heaven that are saved so as by fire. Do you know what that means? They get to heaven, and their whole life was wonderful on earth. I mean, they had every collection, every experience. They had, they had done everything that the world offers, and none of the sins are there because Christ paid for all of them, but they didn't redeem any of their time for the Lord because they didn't, read, they didn't even know what he wanted. They didn't even know the devil was out there. They weren't connected. The spirit was grieved their whole life. They didn't know anything about serving God. They were serving themselves. They didn't get their mind transformed. They were living distant from God. And did you know that describes, sadly, the majority of the Revelation 2 and 3 churches? The majority of them. And the Revelation 2 and 3 churches are a picture of how Christ saw the church in the first century. There are consequences. If we're saved, the consequence of it is eternal life. But if we don't feed on the word of God, then we are going to be emaciated spiritually. If we're not watching out for the devil, we're going to be constantly thwarted by, by his devices. In fact, Peter says we're, we're not ignorant of his devices. And, and Peter talks about, in, in warning the, the people of Asia Minor, he says that Satan is seeking to, to disrupt, in fact, he uses the, the Greek word that the Romans use for terrorists, coming in and striking when you're not looking. And if we're not watching, he's terrorizing our lives. If we're not connected, our little edgers don't even work. If we're not filled with the Spirit, we can't understand the Bible. If we're not investing in heaven, there's nothing that will last forever. And you know what the byproduct of this Romans 12 life we looked at last week? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of the Lord is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. If we're not consecrated to the Lord, we don't know what his will is. We don't know how to invest. We don't, we don't have the guidance of the Spirit. See, all of these things are interconnected. So, let me go like this. Let's just look at them in our Bible, because I just mentioned them. Look at uh, Matthew 1, 21 to 23. Turn back to the beginning. I'm just going to walk through them. This is review. We've already covered this. The elements of salvation are, and, and you remember, I went all the way through the book of Acts and showed every gospel presentation and how they described it. And Jesus saves us from our sins, verse 21, and he moves in so God is with us. So that is understanding salvation. We've already done that. Secondly, we went through a whole series of how to study the Bible. Uh, and I talked to you about the importance and necessity, and that's chapter 4, verse 4. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. And that's seeking nourishment from the Scriptures. And, and the Bible says when we were born again, we had this insatiable hunger. We were like newborn babes. We wanted the Word of God. And that's how we're supposed to persist and just be able to digest it. Thirdly, this, this uh, warfare thing, I told you Matthew 3, 16, immediately he came out of the water after he was baptized, and chapter 4, verse 1, he was led into the temptation. There's a significance to the order that Jesus went right from the spiritual climax of God saying, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased, right into the temptation. And usually new believers, when they're at their crescendo of enthusiasm, is when they're so unexpecting those little nudges by the devil to render us neutralized and useless. And then connected to God, 
uh, that, that whole Matthew 6, uh, we are supposed to be constantly um, living out our connection to him. Then uh, in Matthew 25, investing our life by being a good and faithful servant. Uh, that's our stewardship of life. And we need to understand that we're stewards. You know, some people think, well, I, I earn all this money and I have all this time and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little token of it to the Lord, you know. And, and it's all mine, but I'm going to be nice and give him something. And I'll give some to Nepal and I'll give some to the church. And, but it's mine. And I'm going to give some. No. Our whole life is not our own. That's what it says. What? No, you're not. That you were bought at a price. You're not your own. Therefore, glorify God by investing your life, your time, the giftedness he gave us for the Lord. Uh, by the way, we have covered this, 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 this. Next week, if the Lord tarries, we're going to start here. The next, that'll take more than a week. After that, we're going to look at this investment, how we are stewards of our time and treasures. And then we're going to end with spiritual warfare, this watchful component. So just for you to know, we've gone one, two, three, last week, that, next week, that, in the future, that, and if the Lord tarries, that. Uh, Spirit-filled, we covered that. In fact, uh, I, I'll give you a little, and then consecrated, we covered that last week, but I'll give you a little um, example. Yeah, we have seven minutes. Uh, so this is the whole package. Uh, I believe all discipleship manuals are talking about this component, this personal interaction, and if you boil all of them down, there are about seven broad areas that should be trained until they're part of our life, but the goal of all of it is to be useful to the Lord. And you can't be useful if you're not saved. You can't be useful if you're starving to death. You can't be useful if you're not in step with the Spirit. You can't be useful if you're not getting that renewed. You can't be useful if you don't keep your cord connected by prayer. You can't be useful eternally if you're not storing up treasures in heaven. And we're always a target. Uh, it, it's so important to understand spiritual warfare. Okay, let me just give you a quick example. Um, I, I talk so much about these. Let, whoop, back up. This is the one I want to go to. Let me just, for four minutes, show you what a, a personal face-to-face -face meeting would be. We're talking about being spirit-filled. We did this about six weeks ago. And I said, we're supposed to be not drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. How do you know if you're full of the Spirit? In a in a face-to-face -face personal small group setting you go through what God says are the ways you can tell if you're full of the Spirit it's it's the fruit of the Spirit the fruit of the Spirit is described in the Bible as nine life-altering changes that the Spirit of God brings in other words if my life is surrendered to him he changes me. That's how I know I'm full of the Spirit. So how does he change me? Well, you would sit and talk about love, and love is sacrifice, self-sacrifice. And you'd say, hey, that's what you do it in a small group. Are you sacrificing your ways to follow God's way? Can others trace your progress in expressing God's love? Are you, are you a loving Remember, we're supposed to love our enemies. That's a self-sacrifice for our enemies. And then you go through joy. We did this weeks ago. We went through every one of these. Um, spent a whole service going through them, by the way. Do those that know me and watch my life see evidence through my daily life at work and school that I'm a joyful person? Joy is, is produced by the Holy Spirit. It's not just happiness. It's an internal detachment from my circumstances so that I'm like this. Joy means I'm like this. And my life is like this. And after you talk about that, you talk about peace. It's an internal serenity. It's not just that I'm like this, like this. It's I'm like this, and I'm saying my life is not under my own control. I've been bought at a price, and therefore I have peace through changes and upsets and unexpected twists and struggles and challenges. And people see a growing peacefulness. 
that it, and they say, wow, how are you like that? You say, it's not me. Boy, if I was running things, I'd be going crazy. You know, it's the Lord. And great peace, great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing, 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 because God keeps us in perfect peace because our minds are stayed on him. And uh, the great peace that love thy law is uh, in Psalm 119. But we would cover all those in a small group setting, and we would cover patience, uh, long-suffering. Am I a more patient person, and do people see that? And kindness. Kindness is the absence of of an abrasive manner in my dealings with people. Do people say, when they come out of a meeting with you, and, and they say, wow, you're, every time I'm around you, you're more increasingly kind with people. Is that what everybody comes to your, your small group or your work meeting or your team meeting or your manager's meeting say about you? That you just are getting kinder and kinder? That's a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. And any part of my life that's not growing in peace and joy and kindness, I haven't surrendered. And that's what face-to-face is about. People openly say, ah, that's not happening. And the Together, they say, well, let's pray about that. Oh, how could you surrender more of your life to be kind or to be good? This is being godlike. Goodness is acting like God. Uh, faithfulness strides toward reliability, dependability. Uh, my life is less out of control and more under God's control. Is that what unsaved people watching you say, wow, you're, you're, you're increasingly faithful? I mean, You used to always be late last year, and you're only late half the time this year. What's happened? You say, the Lord's changing me. See, we're supposed to be morphing to be more Christ-like. And gentleness, uh, that's an absence of abrasiveness in my talking with people, and then self-control. Do others think of me as graciously under the control of God's Spirit? And so this is the entire orb, and I tell you once more, It all starts with salvation. And life is totally predicated on knowing what Christ did on the cross for me. All of this I talked about this morning is totally because of Jesus Christ taking my place and giving me a new operating system. I read about that operating system in the Word. I understand that operating system through yielding to the Spirit. I keep that going by renewing that in consecration. I am empowered and communing by my cord connecting me through prayer to heaven. That makes me want to redeem time for the Lord. And I'm always warily watching out because I have an enemy that wants me to not be useful to God. He doesn't want to throw me off the cliff. He just wants me to just get out of the lane. Remember Paul said, I don't want to get out of my lane and get disqualified. He was talking about a race, and there's this lane that you're supposed to stay in in the foot races, or the chariot races. You were supposed to stay where you were supposed to be. And he said, I don't want to get out and become disqualified from being rewarded with my life. All the devil wants to do is get us out of our lane a little bit. And and if we're not full of spirit, we don't hear the spirit saying, no, 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 no. And if we're not full of the word. We don't know that what the lane even looks like. All of these discipleship elements or habits are so connected, but they flow from salvation, and we're done early. So let's all stand one minute early. I want to celebrate that. And, and as we stand, before I pray, some of you might say, I don't even have this. I mean, I don't even know what you're talking about. New operating system? Are you talking about on my phone? No talking about your heart. Salvation starts all this. Or if you're stuck, you're not getting anything out of the word, or you feel like you're grieving the spirit, or you don't even know about presenting yourself in Romans 12. We have elders and deacons that always, uh, elders and Titus two women that always stand across the front. They're holding the Bible. You see most of them, they're standing up here. They are those, they're the first responders. If you say, I don't know if I'm saved, they would like to Open the word of God, pull you off to the side in a little corner here, and show you 
how you today can know you're saved. If you say, I'm saved, but none of that other stuff's working, then say, let's just pick one. And they will, they will point you and pray you to get started. And today, if, if there's something the Lord is, is speaking and knocking and you're sensing, I need to do something, a good thing to do is to start by praying with one of them. Let's bow together. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you designed us at the instant of our salvation and created us for good works. You want us to be useful. You want us to fulfill your plan. You want us to, to live life the best way possible. That's your design. That's your plan. It's written in your word. It's illumined by your spirit. Uh, it's fed to us through our connection and prayer. It's updated every time we get our mind transformed and, and get restarted the way you want us to go. It's because we want to invest our lives and we want to always watch out because our adversary, the devil, wants to devour us. How I pray today that you would help all of us to want to cultivate the habits that will make us highly useful to you because that's all that matters in life. Thank you for meeting with us. Show us your way, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus and for his glory we ask it. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.